Hello my friends, Grim here, and it has been a while since I made a video, been super busy, but you know I've been making a little bit of time for gaming, and it has not been Magic, or Skyrim, or Diablo, it's been Heroes of Might and Magic 3, Horn of the Abyss mod, and that mod has just got its most significant update in years. This patch has brought a brand new faction, it's called Factory, and I am here to give my first impressions of Factory to you today. Now, pro players, top tier PvP guys, you're gonna wanna probably look away in horror, because this video is not about PvP at all. It's about AI from a relatively casual perspective. So with that in mind, thank you so much for watching. Let's get into it. Let's see what Factory looks like within the first couple days of release. And uh, before we do jump into it, one of my children who's helping me make the video here would like to say hi. Hello, everyone. I got a little close to the mic there, kid, but good job. And with that said, we are going to play Reclamation, which is a map that I've beaten a few times before, so a little bit of familiarity upon which to deploy the brand new faction. I'm going to record this in a few different segments. I'm going to begin with um, my progress so far, early game in uh, this Reclamation scenario, give you a little bit of background for my own history with Heroes 3, just to give you some context for uh, exactly how many grains of salt you might want to take this video with. And then after that, we're going to go through the town, building by building, unit by unit, give my first impressions and an overview of what Factory has to offer. And then we're going to continue playing the scenario. So after that, I'll probably jump back into the game at or near the very end of it. So yeah, let's jump in and see what we can do. All right, guys, so I'm just gonna kind of move the map around to show you what we've uncovered of Reclamation so far, which if you couldn't tell by Baja California here, it is a map of North America. Very cool, one of my favorite Heroes maps. I'm just gonna give you a little bit of context. I played the original Heroes of Might and Magic 3 back when it was relatively new, I don't remember the exact timeline, but I must have been, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old. Definitely played it as a kid, definitely sucked, definitely had all kinds of fun. It was one of those games I was on and off with as a kid, like Magic and Diablo and, and all the other games that I've um, mentioned or, of course, featured on this channel before. For me, gaming is a lot about nostalgia. I'm very busy, I'm a father, I don't need the latest game, I don't need the biggest challenge, I need just a little bit of a break from the grind. And Heroes is exactly serving that purpose for me. And as a kid, Horn of the Abyss mod probably didn't even exist yet, and if it did, I probably wouldn't have known how to install it and so forth, but we do have Horn of the Abyss. That's what I've been playing since about May or June of this year, just past 2023, and it really gives the game all kinds of new life. I cannot recommend it highly enough. I don't play any PvP, so what you're about to see, my first impressions, all of that context is in mind. I've only played the real game, quote unquote, for about half a year, and only against AI. I have gotten pretty decent though, nothing pro level, nothing to really brag about, but I started playing regularly on the hardest difficulty impossible a few months ago, and so far I have not failed to beat a scenario on Impossible. My favorite faction is Necropolis, even though it's been nerfed heavily in Hoda, it is still by far my favorite. In the future on this channel, I plan on making a Necropolis strategy guide for use against AI. But for now, today, we're jumping on the new hotness. This is Factory. Let's see what we've done so far. So speaking of strategy, I'll just go over briefly what I've done so far in this game. You start out here in Calgary and then down here in Nogales, and I pretty easily expanded west, just went straight there with my main hero, Dury, and captured this castle. That was a really, really good start. I eventually slew the hero and ended up kind of taking this place at my leisure. Um, 
while I'm just here in the north in Canada. In the mid game, um, at least mid game relative to where I'm at now, still kind of early game, I guess, with Elishar. I fended off an attack, got a few levels, and uh, then just gave this guy three Coatls. And I had already kind of claimed the mines around here and expanded a little bit. I just sent little heroes, scouts, to pick up all the stray resources. But up here, there is a lot of good stuff that was still kind of locked. We had a mercury mine, a gold mine, crystal, windmill, arena, all of this stuff was behind, you know, some relatively small units, but nothing that a scout could handle. So I just gave Elishar three Coatls and he zoomed through that area with a scout following him to pick up all the mines. Definitely an example of that expansion related strategy that I was talking about, but that's just kind of getting rich. What about conquering and defending the other towns that have happened over here on the west coast? Well, I have two heroes mainly to thank for that. I chose to start, as mentioned, with Duri. I mean, we know how powerful Tazar is, you know, the armorer specialist. Duri is the armorer specialist, who also starts with offense. So you really can't ask for more of a straight-up one-two punch from a might hero than this. And... This this hero has rolled some really good things as well. Leadership, magic, wisdom, hopefully logistics is on the menu as well in the near future. I don't know how likely that is, but we went early into the halflings. Heavy halfling spam, engineers, and um, I think I ended up skipping spiders with Dory, or I've lost them in battle, I don't remember which, but I got the sandworms, the Olgoi Korkoi, really, really early, and have just been fighting, you know, classic strategy, fight as much as possible with your main, don't take any unnecessary movement points in any direction if you can help it, have a scout following them around to pick the mines that they clear, pick up the little, um, pick up artifacts and pass them off, pick up stray resources, etc, etc. The other hero that it randomly generated for me to start with, having selected Dury, is Morton, and this guy uh, veteran of Goblin Ogre Wars, apparently, uh, doesn't like dirt skins. A uh, real interesting fellow, and he's a ballista specialist. He begins with the ballista. He's got ballistics as well, so very thematic, and so far he's picked up armor and earth magic. And with this guy, starting from Nogales, I remember from having played this map before that there's a couple gold mines here. So playing on Impossible, of course, you start with nothing except your gold uh, 800 gold I got as a starting point. And, um, you know, so I started with Dury. I picked up a chest, got some gold, used it to recruit Manfred down here. Manfred gave some extra troops, uh, troops, excuse me, to Morton, who then immediately went north and took the gold mines. After that, Manfred went south, picked up some stray resources, turned on this halfling hut, grabbed a couple mines, and we were off to the races there. Starting on Impossible especially, getting the gold mines nice and early is really, really good. And Morton got some valuable experience early on to the point where he was actually ahead on levels relative to Dory for some of this game. And uh, eventually Morton went and took this cove, which really broke open the West Coast for me. And uh, yeah, he's been very impressive as well. So that's about all I have to say thus far, my friends, for where we are in the game. And I'll check back on, uh, on our progress when we're done with the game or when we're close to done. We'll see how it goes. All right, guys, here we are in Columbus, Ohio. The platonic ideal of a factory town, am I right? And this is a fully built town. Well, okay, let's build Mage Guild level five. Now it's a fully built town. You always hate Magic Mirror there at level 5. So anyway, um, there is a lot to say about this, and I suppose real quick before we get into the units, we should talk about the kind of ancillary buildings, the non-creature dwellings. So your resource silo is going to give you crystal. There's a lot of crystal involved, especially in the building and recruitment of the two tier 7 units that this faction boasts. So as always, early game resource silo, if it's going long, is just fine. You have mana generator, which I like a fair amount as the... Um, 
Well, it's going to give 20 additional spell points during any siege defense, and this is mostly relevant if you've got a might hero with low knowledge, lacking things like intelligence, and or if you just have a throwaway hero who's just defending a town, slinging a few magic arrows, maybe you've got like a big stack of more defensive troops there, and you're planning on just, you know, getting three, four rounds of the turret fire in before you inevitably lose well, you can throw a few more magic arrows into the mix as well, thanks to the mana generator. You also have a pen. Um, it's going to increase armadillo production. I think armadillos are probably our worst troop, but again, if money is no object, of course you'll want this, and then they'll amass to defend your town even more than they already would. But bank is the very most interesting and unique from among factories, buildings, I would say, and um, it's kind of unique insofar as that's a no interest bank, right? You get a loan of 2,500 gold and you have to pay 2,500 gold back over the course of five days. And especially early, even into mid game, when money is tight, you can front load your purchases on day one, get as many troops into the field as possible, and then you'll just slowly pay it back over time. So the only investment, of course, is in building the bank itself, but at 5 ore and 500 gold, that is pretty cheap. So this is a really powerful asset. Okay, so on to the creature dwellings, and as I've already mentioned, there are two tier 7 buildings, which is just mind-boggling, and therefore there are eight creature dwellings overall, making Factory very unique in that regard. The first thing to mention, as kind of a broad bird's eye view, is that you probably can't and don't want to build both tier 7 buildings on anything but rich maps and or maps that are guaranteed to go along. You probably want to kind of pick a lane and stick to it if you're playing any kind of a quicker or smaller game than that. But with that said, of course, on Reclamation, especially when you're out ahead early, you have the luxury to kind of do it all. So beginning at the beginning with the tier 1 troop Halfling Grenadiers, and honestly guys, I don't know if it's just me, but they seem extremely overpowered. I'll just make the caveat again before I go on. This is brand new, first impression type of stuff. Not a pro player, not even close. But I think halflings are really, really, really good. They come with positive luck, they're ranged, and they're pretty cheap, and they do 1-3 to three damage. So right out of the gates, you're kind of like in something similar to Master Gremlin territory, although they are more fragile. And, crucially, you do not need to upgrade them in order to make them shoot like you do with Gremlins, so that's really good to begin with. But then the Grenadiers are... they have like a Behemoth-style special ability with their ranged attack ignoring 20% of the enemy's defense skill, and their damage goes up to 2-3. to three. There are other improvements too, but those are the big ones, and they're not even that slow either with a speed of 6, it's okay. So, to me, Halfling Grenadiers might literally be the main reason to play this faction. That early domination, you're just spamming Halflings. There's even a Halfling Specialist, Henrietta, who's quite good. We'll cover her when we get to the Heroes section of this part. But that is actually, like, uh, I, I don't know if I'm overstating it. I don't really want to oversell it. But Halflings allow you to expand very aggressively, very early. They allow you to defend castles early really, really well as well. And then on top of that, they have, for me so far, stayed pretty relevant into the mid game. In tier two, you have mechanics that upgraded to engineers, and these are kind of the these are kind of a microcosm of factory. And what I mean by that is that overall my take on factory just to not bury the lead any further, is that it's kind of maybe average or even slightly below average in terms of just blatant raw power level, but there's a whole lot of tactical utility and niche use cases that make the unit's power skyrocket with a lot of these choices, and I would say engineers are one of them. They're kind of like a medium or even below par tier 2 walker in most ways. However, they do have 
a breath attack, which is tactically interesting and, of course, unique for such a low-tier troop to bring a breath attack to the field. You usually see those, of course, on dragons and so forth. And they repair mechanical creatures, so some of our most powerful units are actually mechanical. And the repair is 20 hit points per engineer, so this is kind of like a resurrection type effect, and that's really really nice, so it does scale with the number of engineers that you have. Between that and the fact that they can do some damage with that breath attack means that they are, you know, likely to be focused to some degree by the enemy, but guess what? So are your halflings, and if they have incentives to focus your tier 1 and tier 2 troops, um, you know, to the exclusion of some of your more expensive and heavier hitters, that must be a good thing in and of itself. So yeah, Engineer's pretty interesting overall, difficult to rate their power level. Out here on the ranch, for tier 3 you've got some armadillos and some bellwether armadillos, and sadly there's not a great deal to say about these guys. They look cool, and they do very little. They have no special abilities. Even, you know, they're kind of like a, a tanky unit, right? But they're not even really that tanky with only 25 health when upgrade. Upgraded, I should say. They do have a very high defense skill, but beyond that, they are nothing to write home about. They're going to slow you down, especially early game with that speed of four. Your engineer or your mechanic is your best early game scout within the first few turns, I mean. Um, armadillos, you really just want to leave at home almost always, as far as I can tell. They're the classic type of slow, tanky troop that you just let amass in your town and then recruit them all to defend it if and when you need to. But, you know, they don't really compare that well to, like, battle dwarves or dendroid guards. You know, those are things that come to mind, in my opinion. Tier 4 brings a really interesting and quite powerful unit, in my opinion. Uh, just at first blush, they're probably not on the level of Vampire Lords, which are an insane Tier 4, but they are pretty good. I would put them certainly above average. They are mechanical, so they can be repaired by the Engineers. They detonate at death, um, and you, that's kind of an activated ability, if you will. And then when they're upgraded, they have no enemy retaliation. So we all know how powerful no retaliation is. Between that and the detonation and the engineer synergy, there's a lot of tactical interesting things that you can do with these automatons. And with a speed of 9, once you can recruit them, they make for good scouts. They're, of course, able to hit and run in a lot of situations, and their overall stats are decent, so a very powerful and characterful tier 4 unit, in my opinion. And I would characterize tier 5 the same way. Characterful and powerful, they are sandworms, and they become uh, Olgoi Korkoi, if I had to guess, but probably just continuing this channel's long and storied tradition of not pronouncing things correctly, but these have been very, very impressive for me. They hit so hard, and they're so mobile, and um, they even have a form of double strike. All of those things seem to indicate to me kind of glass cannon. And don't get me wrong, they're not like, um, you know, super tanky or anything, but they are tankier and more resilient than I expect them to be, and, and perhaps than they have a right to be. I think these are a very decent tier 5 unit. So yeah, thematically powerful, tactically interesting. They move underground, which is really nice. They're immune to blind and stone gaze. Not as nice, but definitely not bad, and devours corpses for additional strikes. So I don't fully know how this works, but it seems to be that if you move onto a hex that contains the corpse of a dead unit while attacking, or maybe even if you just move and then the, the attack is, the double attack is stored up for next time, I'm not clear on that yet, but let's say that you're moving to an attack and you move onto the hex where a corpse lies, well then you're double striking like a crusader or an Asayid or whatever those tier 4 birds are from the cove. Definitely very, very good overall. We've got a ranged tier 6, guys. It is gunslingers that upgrade into bounty hunters, and as soon as I saw the look of them, obviously you can infer right away that they are ranged up at tier 6. I was like, okay, here we go. This is the big selling point of this faction, and I was totally wrong. They're really not that impressive from what I have seen so far. Of course, we all know the inherent power of range. I'm not discounting that. That is certainly prevalent here. And they're, they're somewhat resilient, but you would need and expect that, actually, from a tier 6 ranged 
unit, and um, just statistically, and in terms of their performance, they really don't seem to stack up very well compared to Cyclops or Cyclops Kings. And um, they do have a little utility, but then again, so do the Cyclopes with attacking castle walls. They have, uh, the Bounty Hunters have preemptive shot. Now maybe there's a way to use this more proactively or to abuse it that I haven't seen yet, but so far what I've seen is if your enemy ranged unit attacks the Bounty Hunters, the Bounty Hunters will not only, they, they don't retaliate, they actually shoot them first. And I can't tell yet if it's a full damage shot or what have you. And that's definitely really nice. You know, ranged attacking against other ranged foes is a classic play pattern of Heroes 3. But so far it hasn't really come up that much. And again, as mentioned with some of the utility of halflings and engineers and stuff, I just don't know that the bounty hunters are actually the number one ranged priority for the enemy ranged attackers, especially because, as mentioned, bounty hunters are not really all that deadly, and they're kind of tanky. So I don't know quite how they fit overall. There's probably more than meets the eye to them, but right now I expect it to be blown away, and I'm really not. Now at the top of the heap, we have a, a king and a queen, I guess you could say. We have the Serpentarium for Crimson Quattles, and we have the Gantry for Juggernauts. Now, as mentioned, you probably don't have the resources, especially because it's 20 crystal each, and the troops themselves require crystal to recruit, to do both. And the gold prices aren't really significantly cheaper than any other Tier 7 that you're likely to see. Also, I'm just going to say that overall, I think neither of these are average power for Tier 7. I think they're below average when you compare them to the rest of the Tier 7s in this game. That said, having access to two is just completely nuts in longer games, because you are just churning out a couple Tier 7 units that are very flexible and very tactically interesting. So we're going to begin with the Serpentarium. That is actually where I began with this campaign. I didn't build the Juggernaut building as soon, and I certainly didn't recruit them as early as I did the Quaddles, and that was without knowing anything about them besides the inference that Juggernauts are big and slow and Quaddles are fast and they fly, and that's exactly right, and that proved to be correct strategically because the Quaddles let me be aggressive early on, and then the Juggernauts were more useful for protecting castles or for closing out the game. So in terms of what Quaddles do, they fly as a baseline with a speed of 11, and their stats are a little bit underwhelming. They don't have a breath attack or anything, but you know, it's a tier seven flyer, and they can skip a turn to get temporary invulnerability. And as far as I've seen, that means nothing hurts them. No area of effect spells, no direct attacks, nothing. Now, that's tactically interesting, but it becomes way, way more useful when they're upgraded. Not only do they go to speed 15, not only do they get a good stat boost overall, but they also get temporary invulnerability without skipping a turn. So a classic use case of this would be you're sieging a castle, you go first because you have speed 15, you immediately just give it invulnerability, fly over there, attack their most valuable unit, Sometimes it's a shooter. Maybe you'll just land next to a shooter and attack something else. Now, normally, if you do that with your dragons and dungeon, for example, you are just going to get your dragons mobbed. And that might be okay, depending on the situation, but sometimes you, you wait. You can't afford to do that. With the Quattles, you always have that option. Of course, you can save it and use it later in the battle as well under different circumstances. It makes this unit really interesting. And lastly, we have Dreadnoughts that upgrade into Juggernauts. They do get a big boost in health going from 200 to 300, and then more modest boost to speed 6 to 7, still pretty slow for a tier 7 especially, and attack and defense going from 18 and 20 respectively up to 23, 23. So this is a big solid unit with good stats, but it's not... Um, it's not anything necessarily to write home about, except for the tactical utility that it brings. This is another mechanical unit, so your engineers repairing and resurrecting juggernauts is actually insanely powerful, especially if you can maneuver them into focusing the juggernauts in the first place, which is somewhat not productive for them generally, given how tanky and hard-hitting they are. And then if you add resurrection-style mechanics into it, then you can really turn the tides and, um, you know, really 
kind of escape with, with minimal losses and what would otherwise be a Pyrrhic victory. Now, the other thing about Juggernauts is they can attack with a heat stroke instead of moving. So this is a limited range kind of AoE type of effect. You can't it's not that flexible in terms of where you can point it, so if it's a chaotic melee, you might be hitting some of your own troops in so doing, but it is a, as far as I can see, it does exactly as much damage as a regular attack would do, it has the potential to hit multiple enemies, and even if you're next to them, if you attack with a heat stroke, they do not retaliate. So this is very tactically useful, and in the mid-game of this campaign that we're playing right now, or the scenario, I mean, I one fights I had no business winning, defending against overwhelming odds thanks to Juggernauts and their inherent power, sticking them in the breach of a wall, attacking with heat strokes, shrugging off attacks, and just coming out the other end with what looked like a, a total loss on the cards. So I would say, again, don't want to oversell them. I think they're overall probably less powerful in a vacuum than an average tier 7 unit in this game, but that's true for Coatles as well, and if you have the money to get both, they actually fill each other's gaps tactically really, really well, both in terms of their individual roles on the battlefield and in terms of their strategic roles on the map. So on to the discussion of heroes. I went with Dory to start because I saw that she was the armor specialist. I saw that she's so dedicated to that that she has grafted armor onto her face, it seems. And then, lo and behold, when I actually start playing, she begins with offense as well, which is just totally nuts. From there, we've rolled leadership, air magic, wisdom, and unfortunately pathfinding instead of logistics, but you don't really have mobility spells on this map besides water walk, and there's a fair amount of unfriendly terrain, so pathfinding's alright. Logistics is almost always better, though, but Dory seemed clearly very powerful to me right from the jump, and so she proved. My other notable uh, mains... I'll just briefly give Elishar credit, he ended up being very, very powerful, just kind of recruited him in a pinch to defend my capital, actually. He won the fight, and then he took some quaddles to clear things out, and he kind of snowballed from there, ended up being really, really relevant, but not a factory hero. The other factory hero that I did begin with was Morton. He spawned randomly in my secondary town, and I liked what I saw right from the jump, artillery and ballistics, very... Um, very thematically consistent, and both ended up being really relevant. He did most of my early fighting, and that artillery was crucial for that. He then follows it up with Armorer, Earth Magic, Logistics, and Intelligence. That is a really well-rounded might hero. If this type of thing is representative of how these heroes tend to roll with skills, it's obviously looking very promising. And then Henrietta was kind of my fourth main. She is the halfling expert. I actually think she's wonderful probably to start with or to get early. I didn't see her early and I didn't choose to start with her, but she did appear in my tavern mid-game. In my hour of need, the halfling queen arrives. And, um, you know, she's leadership and luck. Again, this is a really cool duo. And I think the heroes in general for Factory are really well designed. They're characterful, they're cool. I again went with Dory, the kind of obvious choice to really start things off, but it seems like there's a lot of depth and a lot of play and a lot of merit to choosing a wide variety of heroes from what I've seen. And she also followed up with some good stuff. Archery with Halflings, hello, Wombo Combo. Earth Magic, Logistics, and Wisdom. Can't really ask for more than that, and she ended up breaking open the Dragon Utopia. So she's got the most OP artifacts of all my heroes on a map that admittedly doesn't really yield that many OP artifacts. Alright guys, I think we've got the last hero who's just washed up on shore here, and uh, you know, it's our good friend Todd's time to shine. He hasn't really done much adventuring or conquering, but he has defended the west coast like a boss. And Todd takes down spent 16 Archangels against one pirate, developing some tactical knowledge, and that is that. All enemies have been defeated. Victory is yours, and we end with the rank of Black Knight. Not bad for the first time out with Factory.